Hey, hello everyone. My name is Stephanie Singer. I'm so happy to welcome you to the Ohio Agriculture uh, Lunch and Learn put on by the Nature Conservancy. For this quarter, we're really excited to be featuring edge of field as our main topic. And today, I, we are so excited to have Lois Wright Morton with us. She is a rural sociologist with Ohio State University, or I'm sorry, that was a slip there. She's a rural sociologist with Ohio, Iowa State University, and she's also a farmer in Northeast Ohio in Ashtabula County. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lois. And um, just so you know, a little bit of logistics before I do that, you're welcome to put uh, questions in the chat and I will monitor those and um, let Lois know that we have questions and then we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions also. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. I appreciate my uh, TNC colleagues um, inviting me to talk today. And Stephanie did a nice job of, of introducing me. And I might also add that I work closely with Solutions from the Land, which is an NGO that advances agricultural solutions to some of the global challenges that farmers um, are facing and the world is facing. And we bring voices, farmer voices, to UN platforms um, that are talking about the FAO, the Food and Ag Organization, Climate Convention, um, the UN Environmental Program, and the Water Convention. So um, while we're talking about Ohio today, um, I want to remind all of us that the world is much larger in many of the same uh, situations and challenges that agriculture and farmers are facing in Ohio, are facing them around the world. Um, the two questions that we're focused on, on today are, how can farmers create working landscapes that can reduce nutrient losses to Ohio waters and concurrently produce healthy soil, manage for biodiversity and other ecosystem services, and be productive and profitable. If we're not profitable as farmers, then um, solving these other issues um, will be a little more challenging. And so as a social scientist, one of the things that people ask me is, why do farmers do what they do? What influences the decisions they make? And what do they need to be more successful in reaching multi-benefit goals? So today I'm going to spend just a little bit of time um, giving you uh, a flavor of some of the social science research that um, attempts to answer uh, some of those questions. Um, this is uh, me, this is my farm. I'm a uh, specialty crop farmer um, in Northeast Ohio, Pierpont, Eshtabula County, and primarily blueberries and red raspberries. You'll see I have a uh, three quarters of an acre of blueberries under net because of the invasive species, the spotted wing drosophila, but I also co-farm with my brother, corn and soybeans. So I do a diversity of things. You notice many of the slides will have references below of some of the research that supports the work that, um, that I'm sharing today. I won't talk about them, but um, later I know that uh, TNC will make this video available and you'll be able to look up some of those um, journal articles of, of interest to you. So let me go back to talk about Ohio landscapes for a, a minute. Um, we all know that, uh, that Ohio, to our um, H2O Ohio, that we're really targeting the quality of our waters and we're very concerned about not just our lakes, but our rivers. And Ohio is not the only state or the only place that is experiencing ecological um, stresses. Both natural and human disasters um, in our state, in the Midwest, and in the world are just um, totally making it very difficult for agriculture to do the kinds of things that we do so well. If you look at this graph here, you'll see that USDA RMA um, um, has shown us over the last um, few decades, a few years, that the kinds of environmental stresses that we've been facing and the crop losses. Um, you'll see in 2012, we had a huge drought um, across the Midwest in particular, but primarily you're seeing drought and flood. You're seeing the two faces of what happens in a changing climate and the variability that's getting more and more challenging for us um, to deal with. So why do farmers do what they do? The first reason that they do it is to stay in business, to manage their risks. 
Um, the second thing is that as a farmer, I want to be successful. I want to take advantage of opportunities. And more importantly, as a farmer, it's uh, satisfying. We like what we do as farmers and we enjoy um, uh, working the land and producing the crop. So there's many reasons um, that affect our management decisions. And so in the next uh, few minutes, what I want to share is what do what does social science know about how people perceive risk, particularly how do farmers perceive risk that comes with managing um, human and natural disasters, whether, whether we're talking about from a change in climate, whether we're talking about um, market changes, many kinds of shifts um, that create uh, disasters or create change for us. And what constitutes opportunity and how people make decisions. So the first thing to always remember is, um, and each one of us do this naturally, is that personal values influence our management decisions. They influence which crops we choose, influence whether we choose animals or uh, specialty crops, um, how we integrate them, and how we work the landscape. So underlying all the kinds of things that happen from decisions, this isn't just farmers, it's you and me, it's, it's um, all of us underlying the things that we decide to do are some of our personal values. And then it's really important to remember that not all farmers are alike. Now this won't come as a surprise to you because uh, people are all different. We come with um, unique values, different beliefs and different experiences and all of these affect our perceptions of risk, the kinds of resources we have and the skills will also feed into our risk perception and influence whether we're willing to act or respond to a, a hazard or a change. The uh, radar graphs that you're looking at here is some of the research that my colleagues and I did on farmers across the Midwest um, and um, asked them were they concerned about the changes that were happening in climate. And you'll see that there's there's five variables, but what I really want you to take as the global takeaway is we could we could separate into six classes that we could sort of give people a label and say that these farmers were really engaged, that they they thought they needed to do something, they felt that they were at risk, they were worried about hazard, and they were interested in taking some action. Whereas if you look down at class six, you'll see that this group of farmers was rather, we labeled them detached, but really what you see is they're not paying, they're, they're not feeling at all that there's a risk or a problem with the change in the climate. This is in 2013. Um, and they're feeling that they have efficacy, that they have the capacity to deal with the changes that are happening. Um, class five, you'll see that there's a recognition of risk and hazard but they also, again, feel that they have the capacity um, to handle this um, situation. So that gives you sort of a feel that, that um, even within these six classes, we see a great deal of variation. So what, what we need to be thinking about when we make decisions is that our perceptions and our intuition are integrated with information, with data, scientific findings, and they all work together with our values to help us um, decide what it is that we're going to do. I wanna specifically look at system disturbances, the shocks that come from both natural and human disasters. And here's a framework with which that um, um, I work in terms of thinking about how do we encourage people to respond and adapt in order so that we can get agricultural sustainability and resilience. Because in the long run, as a farmer, um, as, a, as an agricultural person that lives in Ohio, that lives in the Midwest, that lives in the United States, I want to be resilient. I, I, want to, I want to farm sustainably so that I don't harm the environment, but I need to make a living. And so I need to um, think about where the risks are and whether I need to do something when there is a natural or a human disaster and um, how I might adapt. So you see the disasters on the uh, left-hand side of the screen and the adaptation outcomes on the right. 
that green box are some of the things that that we're targeting that we're we're hoping are an outcome of our actions and then if you look through we have this perception of risk value social learning i'm going to talk about each one of these in a little bit more detail um, but this kind of gives you the big picture of, of what some of the science, the social science literature tells us if you integrate it in terms of um, how do people adapt um, and respond to the kinds of disasters that happen. And so let's just look at the top for a minute and talk about what are the outcomes from systems disturbances. Um, and basically, we need to think of those as changes in natural and human systems at many levels. Sometimes that disaster happens just at the farm level or at the county level or the region. Sometimes it affects an entire country or community. And so there are different levels that these disasters um, influence. And sometimes they're they're problems and challenges that we have to overcome. Other times they present new opportunities, innovation, new chances to learn and chances to do something different. So um, there are both positives and negatives that come out of those kinds of changes. Um, and so whether we do something or not, whether we're nudged to try different practices or whether we think things are fine, um, we adapt when we perceive that risk is at is uh, uh, that we're at risk, that our farm is at risk. And um, that perception comes out of our values, our social networks, and our individual identities. And there's been a whole uh, uh, several uh, pieces of research that have actually looked at the farmer identity. What does the good farmer um do in response to different situations. And we'll look at this just a little bit more closely. Um, what I want you to particularly look at are these little green um, 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 blobs, the little green, they're not really circular. Um, the social biophysical situation, and that's back to the kinds of changes that are that we're experiencing both from climate, from market conditions, or other kinds of conditions. And those situations, what you see is that um, we reflect um, as individuals about what's that situation look like, and it becomes an input. And then uh, depending on the, the identity within us, and we're only looking at four identities that farmers potentially can carry, but these are really, think of these as roles. We as human beings actually have many identities within, with, within our entire makeup and it comes out of our roles. If you're a parent um, or if you're a husband or wife or if you are a civic leader, each one of those are roles. And depending on the situation, they're activated or they're not activated. And so from an agricultural standpoint, if there's a social biophysical situation that affects our land or our natural resources, if we're a farmer, um, we're going to think about how does how does that affect what's going on? If we're very strongly a conservationist, that's going to affect it. And they all feed back into thinking about who we are and they're complementary um, and competing pressures. Um, that that moves us to some idea of what is the risk um, uh, that this particular disturbance is having. So what's our perception? And humans um, have the capacity to learn. And so this 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 blue box talks about the social learning that we do as the situation changes. Um, uh, what how big is it? What's the problem? What's the assessment? What's it going to cost me? And then are there public policies, market incentives or disincentives? And do I have access to information that that would um, help me uh, feel comfortable as I'm learning about new things and, and new situations? And that moves us that um, I can go with the original option. I can keep doing what I'm doing. But um, as we think about nudging um, ourselves as farmers, or if you're a, if you're a conservation advisor or a crop advisor, if you're looking for ways to nudge farmers 
to move to edge of field practices, to move to doing some things differently um, in order to deal with nitrogen and phosphorus uh, losses off field, off farm, and in order to uh, improve the quality of our water, um, we need to be looking at the, um, these uh, experiments, innovations, things that we could do that might deal with the nitrogen and phosphorus uh, nutrient losses that are happening. And so what we're going to do is experiment with those. Um, and from the social learning standpoint, we'll be assessing the affordability, looking at new knowledge and experience. And you can see that that, again, has a feedback loop back to the social learning. And that moves us out to these new options of, of what it is that we might do. Now, what might some of the new options of edge of field practices might be? I've taken a page from the um, uh, state of Iowa's uh, nutrient reduction um, uh, uh, active or uh, nutrient and oh, excuse me nutrient reduction loss strategy, and you will see that they have spent a number of years actually looking at the literature, looking at edge of field practices and what they might do from a nitrogen reduction and a phosphorus reduction. Um, uh, if you look on the left-hand side, you'll see drainage water management, 33% reduction of nitrogen. Um, if you look at bioreactors, 43%, buffers, 91%, but there's there's some caveats with the with the um, comments because it's within the active zone. Um, saturated but, uh, buffers. And then if you look down on the phosphorus, you can see erosion control, sediment basins, or ponds. So the, um, if you look at the far right column, you'll see that these are edge of field practices. That means that they have no change in your corn yield or your soybean yield or your cropping yield because we're actually talking about edge edge of fields um, but i'm just just to give you a flavor of the work the nutrient reduction strategy that farmers in iowa are using you'll see that there are infield managements there's land use managements and they've actually calculated some averages in terms of if you use those particular management practices that you'll see different, you'll see an effect on your corn yield and what are some of the nitrogen and phosphorus reduction that might happen. I've given the, you the URL if you wanna look at that um, in greater detail. So, but the question we're asking is, which edge of field practices might strengthen the nudge? In other words, I'm thinking as a farmer, gee, I ought to do something. What's gonna push me over the edge? And now it's back to thinking about me as a farmer and what's important, what's happening on my farm. Um, 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 am I concerned about the weather affecting my yield, whether I've seen soil erosion because of, of flooding? Um, am I in drought? Um, have I, has, um, has the, if uh, I'm a specialty crop grower, so I'm particularly interested in fr frost for my perennials. So do I have a late frost that's going to affect um, my yields? And so that's going to affect um, whether the productivist portion of me kicks in or the conservationist. Am I also concerned about nitri nitrates in the water? Am I concerned about downstream um, usage? And how is the weather and things going to affect that? And here's some of those practices that we can see. See the bioreactor being built here in the lower left hand. Um, upland, you see the um, wetlands that um, can filter uh, and denitrification happen from the tile lines. You see terraces. There's lots of different combinations of things that you can do. And both the productivist in this and the conservation of this, is, these are complementary. It's one of the beauty of edge of field practices in particular is that they don't affect our yields um, unless we actually have to take something out of of a field because of continuous flooding and we make a decision to make it into a wetlands, which takes us um, back to our um, framework again. And you can see this new option over in the right-hand side of adaption, 
Um, some of these edge of field practices um, will increase the efficiency of how nitrogen is uptake and has kept from being um, uh, um, downstreamed into uh, water bodies, into the uh, river or to the lake. Um, and in some instances, it may be that you have to redesign. You, you have a portion of your field that's continually wet. The weather is always flooding. It doesn't drain even when you have tile drain. And maybe that becomes a candidate for redesign. Is this really a natural wetlands? Am I losing money on this field because I'm pouring fertilizers? I'm pouring other kinds of uh, nutrients. I'm 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 um, running the tractor and fuel over that area, and quite honestly, I lose a crop. My my yields are just down every some every every year. So maybe you ne there needs to be um, a redesign. Now, so we're looking at these these new options, and the other thing that you're thinking about as a farmer is what are some of the multiple benefits of trying new practices. So, um, and how might, if I choose a particular practice, might I get several benefits, not just one benefit? Uh, um, here is a, a recent farm poll that um, is looking at um, the interaction that people have with um, their conservation specialists. Nudging farmers to experiment and try new practices um, comes from what we learned from other farmers on our interactions. We combine that with personal experience, looking at what's happening to my neighbor's farm, what's happening to um, um, other farmers who tell their stories. And then it comes down to experimenting with practices on my farm in my microclimate and learning what's a failure, what's a success. And quite honestly, some practices work really, really well under both drought and flooding. Other practices may be particularly better suited for flooding or for drought. But lastly, we have expertise in all of our states. We have the land grant university, extension advisors, uh, conservation professionals, crop advisors that understand many of these practices and um, are very willing to help farmers. And we also have a number of um, H2O has, uh, Ohio um, has resources that we're investing in our land management so that we can, can prevent um, off-farm uh, nutrient losses. So engaging your conservation advisors and, and conservation specialists often also comes with the opportunity for cost uh, sharing and some resources that can help you do that. What I want you to see here with this, this uh, farm poll survey that was done last year, that about a third of Iowa farmers have consulted with a conservation professional um, um, on their land, the land that they farm in the last three years. Now, you might ask the other two thirds, there could be some real benefits if, if they would move in that direction. So this is this is the full uh, the full framework way for us to think about it, um, and we're just at uh, almost twenty five minutes, so we do have time for questions. This is I have the east branch of the headwaters of the Ashtabula River that runs through my farm. Um, I'm called Outwash Terrace because the Wisconsin glacier. When it receded, um, left a number of terraces along with many really very uh, beautiful scenic rivers um, that flow north into um, Lake Erie. And so what you're looking at is uh, the wetlands, the bottomlands, my tile, my corn soybean tiles run into a wetland before they come here to this uh, headwater. So there's a... Um, uh, my website, if you'd like to look at it, so you has a my climate data, my weather data there also. All right, with that, I'm going to quit. Looks like maybe we have about five minutes. Stephanie, uh, what kinds of questions do those of you that are uh, listening and watching have? Yeah, what kind of questions? Anyone um, who is listening right now, please feel free to come off mute and ask the question, or you can also type it in the chat and I can relay it to Lois. I have a question. 
Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm wondering, based on your framework and your knowledge, um, what would you say, like if we were going to invest in edge of field practices in some way, what would you say a first investment would be or an initial investment if we were going to do that within the next six to nine months? Do you have a recommendation based on this framework or where we might start to nudge farmers to the edge? Um, yes. Um, it comes back to thinking about what's important to that particular farmer and the landscape itself. So um, most most agricultural lands have or uh, farms have places that are highly productive, very, very productive. But on the edge, they also have lands that are less productive, again, because they're in lowlands or they're in places that um, some years you get a crop off of it and some that you don't. And so that really is the best place to start. And then to think about whether, you, what, you know, what are you planting in that that um, that edge? What Because the goal is to intercept the, the soil and the water that's coming off the fields. And so the question is, do you have something at the end of your tile line? Uh, I, I actually, for me, my water filtration, the nitrate filtration of um, that water just pours right off of my fields in the springtime. And uh, what I want to do is to keep them from running directly into the river. Um, and so uh, I th uh, so I think th that is a really um, easy um, nudge, if you will, to to have farmers look at where where does that tile lane come out? And, you know, is there um, a, a few uh, hundred feet or something that that could be planted to vegetation because the issue is the vegetation is what sucks that sucks up the the, the nutrients of that so now what kind of vegetation you plant I'm always reminded and that one of the reasons I showed you the pictures with the beautiful flowers my my um, giant lobelia grow down here um, as as do the uh, uh, asters and and uh, goldenrod but I have a lot of really interesting wetland flowers that are pretty exciting, that excite me about um, growing things there. And my, my father, who was a farmer before me, I can remember when my mother started showing him the bottle Jensen. Now, most of you probably don't know what a bottle Jensen is, but it's a little, it's, it's a little a wildflower that likes to be, it's rare, um, uh, that likes to, likes wet areas. And when, once my mother showed him whoa, look at what we have. This is really cool. He then was more careful about protecting it. <laughs> um, and just like my brother now knows where my giant lobelias are, and they're they're clearly in the edge of the field that, that he keeps trying to plant the corn and soybeans, and th the crop just doesn't, the yield just isn't there. So it's it's matching what kinds of things in nature um, do they really find exciting, beautiful? Is it birds? Is it because we're we're whole people? We're not just farmers that just that produce something in the land. We we appreciate the environment. We appreciate the trees, the the plants, and so they need to. Uh, I think every farmer, or if you're a crop advisor, needs to help them find. What is the vegetation in nature, the natural vegetation that you find very satisfying and very appreciative? And instead of thinking of it as being in the way because I can't make a profit out of it, think of it as being a filtering system so that I have a really healthy farm and a healthy environment. So that's, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but again, thinking about what's important to the person that you're talking to and triggering that. I had one quick question, um, and you might have answered this, but I might have missed it. In regards to the 2013 survey, you had those people who you called detached and confident. And I was wondering if there was follow up to see how those um, surveyed participants feel after, you know, the last 11 years of dealing with climate change in their fields. Oh, that's a that is a really, really good question. Um, and I have to say that that was a USDA project um, that that started in 20, 2011, that we did eight states and we had we had about 200 farmers enrolled in the project. 
And that was just at the beginning of some of the instability and the recognition that climate it was changing and affecting our environment. And if you look at recent surveys, not of that particular group, but if you look at recent surveys that are coming, uh, farm poll surveys that are coming out of the Midwest, uh, again, Iowa in particular, um, there's a much higher rate of recognition that that um, the climate is being uh, changing much more quickly and much more variable. Farmers have always had to deal with a changing climate. I mean, this is this is not a brand new thing when we start saying climate change, oh, we've got a big problem. Um, farmers for centuries have been dealing with a changing climate. What's happening is though, that many of the, the uh, extreme, um, rain events, uh, wind events um, are accelerating. And so there's an instability in the climate that we've not seen historically. And many farmers, um, and so there's a combination of both natural and human uh, variations that are happening. Uh, but we've not surveyed that particular, um, th that particular group again, but that would be a very interesting thing to do. Good, good suggestion. Hey, Luis. Uh, I just want a quick comment and also one uh, question. So first, uh, you I don't know you know that, but you are, you are kind of inspire me to join the TNC, actually. Uh, all, the inter all the interviewing, a lot of questions. I wasn't sure, you know, conservation, you know, I transitioned from research and then education to the conservation. I wasn't sure how things are going to go. So actually, just happened, I found a lot of your paper, you know, re regarding how, you know, farmer thinking, everything, uh, so at least I think give me some free you know framework let me to have some clue uh, how to addressing this I think I want to thank you for that actually um, and also in your book uh, the pathways for getting to the better water quality uh, the citizenship uh, the, the the citizen effect so uh, you one of the uh, I think the uh, article you talk about the power influence uh, so you talk you you talk about the peer to peer uh those influence so one thing I, I was a little uh you know unclear is about uh, you talk about some farmers if they get uh, to the social uh circles with more farmers uh, they will be more uh, satisfying with their conservation work but if they are you know get a more uh, exposure or you're talking to the non farmers they are less satisfying with the conservation work. So, what? what uh, so, what exactly that happened? And then, what? what could, you, could you explain that kind of? Yeah. <laughs> well, first of all, we're 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 all subject to peer pressure. <laughs> so that's kind of one of the things that's going on. The other thing, when when you see the different kind, when I just showed the, I showed six different classes of farmers, but there's actually far more. Than, than that. And some are very leading edge, very willing to experiment and try different things. Some of us, I, I'm a middle of the road farmer. I, I want to see somebody else go do it before I go do it. But there are farmers that that are very, very willing to go out and try things. And, and I work with and, and solutions uh, from the land. I work with some very leading edge farmers that are just very interested in the technology. They're interested in trying new practices. And what happens is that in, uh, when other farmers see someone else experimenting or trying new things, it gives you as a farmer that's the middle of the road farmer permission to go try it and permission to fail. None of us like to fail. But if we see somebody that's out there trying it and they can see that uh, cover crops is a beautiful example of that. It works some places and not other places, but it works a lot of places to solve many of our soil erosions and our, our nutrient losses. And it takes a while for us to watch what our neighbors are doing, those leading edge ones. Um, and, and so there's no substitute for demonstrating. There's no substitute for going to, on somebody's farm where it's working. And somebody's farm that's not working, uh, cover crops is a beautiful example, has really bad soil erosion and you're losing, you're losing nutrients. Um, that has to be a, a value that you begin to realize, and it happens. It, it doesn't. Sometimes it's an aha moment, and other times it, it's no longer socially acceptable for 
um, us to lose soil off of our fields and our farms into rivers. It's just not acceptable, whether you're a farmer or whether you are um, a neighbor or um, a person that's very much into the environment. And so we need to help farmers find strategies, uh, find ways, um, and, and recognize that um, we need to do something differently. And I'm, I'm the first one that's guilty. All of us are using computers. I hate it when Microsoft says, oh, I've got a new update for you. And I go, no, I already know how to do it. Please don't send me something new. So it's a, it's a, it's a human response. So that I don't think too many of us get, oh, great. They just, they just upgraded my, you know, my Word document to, to, uh, uh, with, with new bill, bells and whistles. And so, um, I already have something that works. And so it's a natural inertia to say, I have something that's worked. It takes time to learn something new. It takes time to try new edge of field practices. It takes time to establish them. Um, and it takes money. Um, and I don't know what the outcome is. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So what we need to do, this nudging is really encouraging each other, farmer to farmer, um, um, neighbor to neighbor saying, well, let's just give it a try and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, then we'll tweak it. We'll try something different and it's okay. 